Great, I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the Publishers Desk podcast. My name is Pier Paolo Finaldi. I'm the CEO and publisher of the Catholic Truth Society, a publisher which has been serving the Catholic community in the UK and abroad for over a century and a half. We've published everything from prayer cards to booklets to leather-bound liturgical volumes and everything in between, and have published great Catholic authors, including Cardinal Newman, Ronald Knox, G.K. Chesterton, and many others. Today, I'm very happy to be speaking to Katie Carl, uh, another in our uh, long line of distinguished authors, um, and the author of one of our latest releases, Praying the O Antiphons, My Soul Magnifies the Lord. So um, welcome, Katie. Um, Katie is the editor-in-chief of Dappled Things magazine and the author of As Earth Without Water, uh, published by Wise Blood Books um, also this year. You've had a busy, busy writing year, I see. Um, she's a senior affiliate fellow of uh, Penn's Programme for Research on Religion, Urban and Civil Society, and is pursuing her MFA in creative writing at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. So um, thanks for being with us and uh, for talking to us about your, your latest creation, which I have one of the first copies here in my hands, looking rather lovely. Um, so uh, to those who are new to your work, um, can you explain how you came to edit this splendidly named magazine, uh, Dappled Things? Sure. Thank you so much, uh, by the way, for having me on the show. I'm really grateful. Uh, to the short version of how I came to edit Dappled Things uh, is simply that as a new graduate in English and creative writing, I was looking for a way to use some of that education, use some of that formation. Uh, and I had been really passionate about the Catholic literary tradition, uh, about uh, finding fiction in the contemporary setting that still uh, carried forward um, you know, some of those themes and uh, and techniques, right, uh, in a landscape that can be fairly bleak uh, and nihilistic, um, trying to find uh, something that would be, um, you know, not what Flannery O'Connor would call um, instant uplift in a sort of pejorative sense, um, mm. but, uh, you know, truly, genuinely sustaining and uh, and deep um, engagement with reality and with uh, you know, both the, the evil that can be possible in human life and the good. Um, so a, a literary aesthetic um, that you know, they, they incorporated all those things became really important to me, but I didn't know of anywhere that uh, was pursuing anything like that until I came across the Dapple Things community. Uh, and long story short, I started first to contribute and then to um, to volunteer on the editorial board. Um, so it's a it's a group of well, we're still a volunteer run organization a nonprofit, uh, but it's uh, you know it's a beautiful thing to be part of, and I'm really grateful to have that opportunity. Brilliant. So I'm, I'm really interested by your concentration on, on beauty. And um, I often feel that Catholics have somewhat abandoned beauty, kind of falling back on ultimate truth or the real presence. So, for example, our, our churches don't need to be beautiful because they contain the real or our writing doesn't need to be beautiful because it contains the truth. Um, I mean, is that something that you you would say you've you've kind of noticed? And and why is beauty so important? Um, why is it as important as ever? Sure, I think uh, it's important to distinguish between beauty as decoration and beauty mm. as transcendental, right? Um, and I think beauty as transcendental is what deserves and continues to have the emphasis, but it doesn't mean that it excludes um, you know, at least some decorative element. Um, you know, but uh, in architectural terms, you know, the hope is that we're we're decorating our constructions, not constructing our decorations, right? That we are um, looking into the nature of things and seeing. Um, you know, both the goodness that God has created and the ways that human beings can sometimes distort that, that goodness and uh, placing our emphasis more on God's creation and then on, on the very real distortions, which in literature you can ignore, mm. um, but in, in uh, worship and in liturgical art, and this distinction is something I think a lot about, uh, right, in sacred art, I think the focus belongs, um, you know, more on the, uh, I guess, what you would call in, in aesthetic terms, the Apollonian, or the highly ordered and the highly um, refined forms of beauty, where literature, um, which is a deep interest for me, can sometimes 
dip more into that uh, that wild and chaotic side of human life, I think that there's um, a sense in which you know, our, our worship, right, belongs in this highly ordered um, the space um, that, that helps us rise above the, the chaos. Yeah, I think, I think that's been an important element of, of the work that we've done, um, especially recently. I mean, we, we, we came into liturgical publishing when, when uh, the translation was kind of redone in, in uh, 2010 mm -hmm. and really kind of concentrated on the fact that uh, beauty has to be kind of front and center in in that it, it 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 needs to be kind of ordered it needs to be beautiful it needs to kind of reflect the the order and the majesty of, of the words in the books themselves and i think that's kind of rolled out across our list as well uh, and I, I hope that we've managed to communicate something of that that beauty in in this uh, small volume that, that we've prepared with you um i think it's um it's so important to um, make space uh, and to prepare beautifully for these uh, these feasts that the church gives us um, and uh, Christmas in particular. And yet we live uh, in a world which just seems kind of incapable of of the delayed gratification that is Advent, I think. Um, so what inspired you particularly to look at this time in the church's year? Sure. I have always loved Advent. I love it precisely as a time where we're developing a sense of order and a sense of peace and a return to the center of things um, it, where much of our years can be kind of this centrifugal force that flings us out of our center and toward the things of the world. I think Advent is a time uh, for pulling back in and returning to the, the, the focus on what's most important. Um, and it's a, it's a lovely season because it has some of the penitential character of Lent, but also the, the great joy uh, that uh, if uh, you know, anyone who's prepared to welcome a new child into their home knows that there is, you know, at the same time, there's this bustle of activity, but there's this very deep calm and joy that can come with that as well. So that's something that I love about Advent in particular. Yeah, as a, as a father of seven, I can really, uh, really relate to that there's always that kind of excitement and yet you know that there's going to be there's going to be a big change as well um so even even when it's something that you've lived over and over again uh, i think christmas very much like that um there was there's a uh, one one of the questions that i i wanted to kind of home in on is that you, you said that we we have that penitential character so it's it's a bit like lent but in a sense i always feel that going forward to the to easter to the resurrection which is kind of such a cause of such cosmic significance and it's very difficult to get our heads around because you know none of us have experienced you know that that resurrection in the in the same kind of in that that bodily sense uh, christmas is almost kind of more accessible to us would you would you agree with that sure i think um or Right. It, it precisely is the season where we it, we see God come down to humanity and speak to us in terms that are very familiar and very uh, appealing. Right. So it's it's sort of God's way of leading with beauty to be born as a as a tiny baby. Um, it, it makes him very lovable, makes him very accessible, makes him very um, very close. Right. Um, you know. And this is uh, related to what we were talking about with uh, the, the question of why beauty is so important because you know it's not that it you know, is divorced from truth in any way, um, you know, or that it lifts us over, um, you know, the difficulties of the intellect, which remain very real, um, but it sort of in integrates um, that, that, you know, very cerebral space with, with our heart, and as humans, we need both. Um, we won't do well without either one of those. And, and I, I think that we see that, that that is the case in just the sheer amount of kind of beautiful art that has been inspired by this this season um i always you know when, when when you work in in publishing and in design in the catholic world you know there, there are various kind of moments where you know it's going to be difficult to find a good image and christmas is definitely not one of them um you know there's there's so much um and it's i i noticed here in in england 
every year they they still come out with stamps you know the royal mail um comes out with the nativity stamps every year um and uh nobody kind of objects to that no yes, um listen so um I, th something that I thought was was um, very interesting in in the kind of opening um, the introduction to your, to your book is you were speaking about um, how the the Magnificat to which the O Antiphon um, which the O Antiphon precedes in those last in that last week of Advent uh, is is a woman's prayer. Um, and uh, you know, in a church where we're, it's often, which is often accused of giving insufficient importance to the woman's perspective, um, you really bring that out in this book. Do you want to just give us a kind of feeling of what, where what you, uh, you you were saying about that? Uh, sure, and I think it uh, it tracks back to um, your conversations about the the difference between the Petrine dimension of authority in the church and the Marian dimension. And the interesting thing about the Petrine dimension is that it's more worldly. It's more the you know the world's sense of what an you know what cultural authority looks like and sounds like and behaves like. But um, you know I think that we've all seen that that can be you know used well and used for the good of others or it can be radically, um, you know, it can get radically off track. Um, whereas the Marian dimension of authority is precisely holiness and that's equally accessible to every believer, regardless of gender, regardless of you know, social or class distinctions, regardless of education, you know, regardless of race, regardless of all these kinds of things that can divide us, um, you know, the Marian dimension of authority, uh, which is precisely holiness and, you know, it, closeness to God can be, um, you know, it is equally accessible, can be radically equalizing, and, um, you know, is a model for all people um, in a way that the Petrine dimension, um, you know, is, is placed or should be placed at the service of, uh, of others um, in the in the worldly sense, um, you know, holiness is placed at the service of others in you know, in a supernatural sense. And there's something that's almost, uh, there's a line from an encyclical, and I'm absolutely blanking on which encyclical this is, um, but that, you know, through this dimension, Mary has other and greater powers than the apostolic. Um, and it's not that she lacks a connection to the apostolic dimension of the church, but it's that the way that she models authority for us is different and yet no less, um, mm. no less important, no less, uh, no less relevant. Um, so, uh, you know, that that the Magnificat is Mary's prayer and that we hear her, you know, what we might call after, you know, scripture scholar Michael Peckluck sort of overtones of Mary's voice in the antiphons. Um, you know, it, I think it leads us to consider that, uh, you know, she she's reconciling a lot of oppositions in her character. She's, you know, at once this woman of the old tradition and yet she's being completely receptive to this new thing that God is doing in and through her. Um, and in her complete receptivity to that um, new and yet completely consistent and consonant, um, you know, reality with, with everything that's come before, um, you know, she gives us uh, a way about our own engagement with, uh, with the tradition that's come before us. You know, we're, we're like the steward who brings the old and the new out of the storehouse mm. and both are good. Um, it, that's uh, an image that I sat with a bit. Um, although I'm not sure if that got deeply into the manuscript, um, but her responsiveness to God, her, um, you know, reconciling these apparent oppositions um you know she's she's also um in god's incarnation where he reconciles these oppositions you know god and man transcendence and eminence she too is fully embodying that and she as i say in the introduction um she can both show us how to be fully human as christ himself did um but christ himself couldn't show us how to follow christ um it's mary who can show us how as merely human creatures we can follow christ yeah, and, and I think this it's interesting when in the Gospel of Luke it speaks about Mary kind of pondering all of this 
these things in in her heart. Um, all these things, whether it's the Magnificat or the Rosary, even more famously, she kind of invites us in to ponder these things with her and to reach the same conclusions. Um, so I think that that's a that's a particularly important kind of dimension to to uh, Mary's role that, that we can all kind of um, take part in. I mean, um, to, to think about. Uh, it's interesting that in in these, I would say that in the in recent years, the Oantiphons have made a bit of a, a bit of a comeback. I would say, um, I must say, growing up, I, I don't think I, I'd ever really heard them mentioned, and then they suddenly became became a thing, as they say. Um, and uh, beyond, obviously, the favourite uh, Advent Carol, you know, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which uh, which contains them. So, what do you think is behind this kind of resurgence of the? of these antiphons um, because uh, no it's just because they you know they had they certainly had a kind of artistic tradition um and then it then it's kind of it seems to have kind of resurfaced i would say I, I think it links back to a sort of larger movement toward um you know looking at the sources of you know, of liturgical uh development in the church and being you know greatly interested in these uh, these the beautiful liturgies and beautiful aspects of the liturgy, right? Uh, and, and I know that there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, you know, engagement with this, but uh, to bring it very much down to earth, um, it, it just in our own family life, we started praying them, my husband and I, several years ago when we started to light an Advent wreath with the children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as you, I'm sure as a father, many know that that's a very earthly thing. You're, you know, you're keeping the toddler off the table with one hand while you're lighting the flame with the other. Um, so it is this reconciliation of opposites. It's this, you know, this extremely beautiful lofty thing that's coming right down to where you are um so i think it it part of it at least is a lot of families wanting to offer this richness to their children um you know this this gorgeous language and this beautiful conceptual framework um but again it can it can sometimes feel distant because there's so much history behind it um you know the whole history of god's revelation and salvation history and the you know, the story of the chosen people through the jewish uh tradition right and and so you're you're sort of providing a bare bones framework for beginning to understand that um, but you're doing it in such a beautiful way that hopefully later there's more and more and more to unpack indeed so yeah the 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 titles are full of meaning and symbology if that's if that's a word um how do you approach them in in this book um i mean you can summarize it a bit uh, the, the the titles and where you went with them. Sure, I mean I take it as read in the book that there's a disconnect maybe in the in the contemporary mind with some of these images. They're mm. not things that are part of our everyday life or of Christ or at the time that the. You know, these liturgies were being developed in the early church. Um, you know, they're very much of the ancient world in a way that I think can be harder for contemporary readers to access. Uh, so what I did was I tried to dig into the imagery and talk about how that might connect to um, you know, ways that we might understand that, ways that that might be, the some of the language might be difficult for us or feel distancing to us, but that there's something deep in here human nature, I think that still responds to each of these images. Um, and again, as a, as a literary person, that's, uh, you know, that's where I live, it is in the, um, the correspondence between different images that we encounter and what's deep in our nature that responds to those. Indeed, indeed. I, I mean, which, which one did you, would you say is kind of the most difficult to, to get a handle on as a 21st century um, Catholic speaking over Zoom? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say, um, you know, I think the the whole question of what it means to be uh, two questions then, um, uh, what it means to be centered, to have a center, right? What is the it, what's the relevance? Um, of having an orientation um, with O Orients, right? Where mm. 
East, um, you know, the, the sense of liturgical East is something that we do think about, um, but, but there's something that spreads out to the entirety of our lives, what it means to be directed toward something as our, as our final end, right? I think that that's, that's maybe difficult for us, and maybe the ones that refer to authority um, are, are difficult for us because we have such a fraught and challenged relationship with that that concept in our culture, um, you know, and not without good, you know, very good reason, um, you know. That Obviously, I, are we in the United yeah. Kingdom yeah. pick that up much, much better than our cousins over in the, in, in the <laughs> Republic in the States. Sure, but you know, as we just celebrated the Feast of Christ the King, I think that that's something that we have to grapple with as we think about what it means to have Christ as the King of your life, um, mm -hmm. you know, and to follow that leadership and you know think about where we're going uh, where he's leading us so, so those are the kinds of considerations i dove into um, those are some of the ones i think it might pose the most challenge but also be incredibly fruitful in meditation mm. no, i mean it's interesting I, I mean you were speaking about the kind of orientation and i mean the world speaks about orientation all the time in, in a often in a sexual sense and in a very kind of debased sense in, and doesn't isn't able to really speak about man's telos, you know, where where it is that we're going. Um, so to to speak of Christ as as the you know the the ori the morning star, the one who comes towards us and the one to whom we're all going is is quite a kind of revolutionary thing to speak about. Um, the the other the one that I I always um, I'm always interested in is is when we when we speak of him as the key. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts on on that one from the book? Uh, I, I, I imported uh, a concept from literary theory to talk about this. Um, I said, when is a newborn a key? When he's an interpretive key, uh, when mm. he helps us understand um, the, the the experiences that we have, when he helps us understand who we are and exactly where we're going. Yeah. No, and I think that's particularly important at, at, at the moment when, you know, in the world, there's so many things that I think we're all trying to understand. We're all trying to understand where it's going, what's kind of happening. And uh, I think it's extremely uh, consoling to know that we, ha we have the key um, to all of this. Um, exactly. Brilliant. There, there's, there's a, there was a part at, at, at the end of the, of the book, which I found particularly kind of fascinating, where you... Um, I mean, having having explained all the different titles of uh, of Christ in the in these antiphons, you then go on to say that even the the O of the O antiphons has quite an important meaning. Um, so, where where did that idea come from? Uh, and somewhat borrowing from Carol Hauslander there, who talks in the read of God about the openness of, say, a musical instrument or of a nest or of a chalice, these natural and, you know, artificial, uh, artificial in the sense of things that humans make, but we make them because, or, or the creatures make, but we make them because they serve a purpose, right? Um, and, and the sound, um, you know, it, even in a poetic sense, the sound of the O serves as this vocative and and evocative you know, function where you know we are admitting our human vulnerability and our incompleteness without God and the fact that there is sort of as you know people popularly say a God-shaped hole at the center of the human heart and that we're not going to be content you know as Augustine says our hearts are restless until they rest in him right um, but also that we're you know in Advent particularly we're open to receiving um, you know what we're meant to to receive and to contain right um you know and to being to being led toward that um you know that uh, Oliver Trainer too, in a book called Seven Bells to Bethlehem, which, uh, you know, I, I didn't uh, directly quote, but I did read and think about a bit as I was preparing to write this, talks about the, um, you know, even the, the openness of, right, the, like the body itself, like in childbirth, right, you're, um, you know, you are serving as a conduit for, um, you know, for what's been created in and then through you, which is just, um, amazing incredible reality um it, you know and that again that's there's something sort of miraculous about that e even the natural aspect of that um and it, you know the the 
crying out in childbirth and then the crying out of the newborn who is born and is you know, has nothing but need to bring to the world at first and yet that need itself is a gift right um you know, I think that that sound has all of those resonances and more, right, from the from the classical tradition of literature right down to the only sound that a newborn can make. Um, I think it, it's really profound. Fantastic, thank you. So um, let's, uh, I mean, we're, we're in November, we're, we're definitely kind of moving towards the great feast. So I just wanted to ask you, um, what's your kind of favorite uh, text or, or him or Carol about, um, that can help us kind of prepare for Christmas. Uh, I am partial to the hymn Gabriel's message where we get the uh, you know, the little hint of the Gloria that's coming and we sing that in my family even in Advent my uh, my oldest middle name is Gabriel uh, mm -hmm. so we have a special devotion <laughs> you might say to uh, to this angel who brings the message that's uh, you know going to require a total overturning <laughs> of everything that uh, you, you know that we that we thought was was valuable or was uh, was important, but you know, it's going to bring us more joy than we could have imagined, too. Fantastic. We'll uh, we'll definitely sing sing one of those with you in mind uh, over Advent. So um, it's been great to speak with you. Um, just uh, for for all the listeners, uh, where can people connect with you? Where can they uh, uh, have a reader for the things that you've been writing? Um, where's the what's the best place to to get in the, uh, get get to, to know your writing? Uh, thank you for asking. Um, I'm extremely offline most of the time, <laughs> um, but I do have a website uh, which I'll drop into the chat. It's uh, Dapple Things Carl, all one word. Dot .wixsite .com. Um, and uh, those who are web designers will have to forgive me. It's very, very do it yourself. But uh, I do have a list of those um, articles I've been publishing most recently uh, and links to both uh, Praying the Great, o Great o Antiphons and um, to my novel. Brilliant. So um, the book is, is available from the CTS website. Uh, and from Amazon and uh, wherever you get your, your good Catholic books from. Um, and uh, I really, um, I recommend it to everybody as a wonderful way to, to live those, that last week before Christmas, uh, when we're all busy and running around like crazy and uh, watching our 10th, you know, nativity play and uh, whatever it is. Um, but to take a moment to really uh, allow yourself to be, uh, kind of immersed in in these wonderful titles of, of uh, Jesus Christ in the moments before Christmas. So thanks very much, Katie, and uh, uh, I really hope this this book um, gets the the wide uh, recognition that it, it deserves. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. What a gift. <laughs>